Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Getaway Day. I am Mason. This is Gotham. And uh, today we're going to be talking about what uh, is really the only news in Major League Baseball this uh, this past week. Uh, exactly one week ago today, um, the uh, CBA negotiated between the Players Union and the MLB in 2016 expired. And at 12.01 a.m. on I guess technically it would be Thursday morning. Uh, Major League Baseball instituted a lock-in. So all the front office guys and all the players gathered at the stadiums with their pajamas and their sleeping bags, and they all hung out and had a great time. Oh, lock out. Sorry, sorry. Not a lock-in. That's, that's a way different thing. That would be fun. Uh, no, Major League Baseball instituted a lockout of all the players at 12.01 uh, last Thursday morning. Uh, effectively ending 26 years of um, what's been described as labor peace, but we'll kind of get to that in a minute because I'm not sure that's necessarily the best phrase to use. Um, but yeah, uh, so Gowie, how have you been dealing with the lockout so far, with there being literally nothing else to talk about? Um, well, been digging into it, and you're going to soon come to realize that we are not labor experts by any means, but I think we've done enough homework to the point where hopefully we can describe some of these very complicated um, issues that are kind of all interrelated and uh, just kind of let you know what's going on with, with baseball right now while there are no transactions. If you want transactions, go back to last week and listen uh, to that because we talked about a ton of transactions that happened and, and we didn't even get to all of them we were thinking that we would be able to do some of that today but i don't think we're gonna have time we'll be here for like eight more days if we finish up last week's transactions but no but on on a personal level though because like you and i are so invested in just paying attention to what's happening in baseball and then things just stopped so like for the first three days i didn't know what to do with my hands like <laughs> how are you doing on a personal level with this lockout? Um, are you, I'm doing are you all right, but I guess it's only been a week, but maybe in a couple of weeks, it'll be different. Yeah. I I've uh, started um, just using like the traditional small talk. Like I've talked about the weather this week and it's weird. Oh, I don't no. like it. That's yeah. Gross. I know. But, but yeah, so I guess the, the, the big question here is so, this is a lockout, so it's been instituted by the league. So I guess probably the question that a lot of people uh, that are just casual baseball fans want to know is like, what is the difference between this and like 1994 when there was the player strike? Why does it have a different name? What's the difference? Would you mind explaining that? Yeah, so a lockout and a strike in a lot of ways are similar in that there's no work being done at that point in time. Uh, the lockout is what the owners have or the, the management has as their tool in a labor negotiation to say, hey, you can't work until you agree to the deal that we're going to come to. Um, and then the strike is the other side where the employees say, we're not going to work until you agree the management to the deal that we want. So it's it's each side's big tool that they have uh, in these negotiations to get the upper hand. So here we have the um, the MLB owners, uh, the league locking out the players because they want to impose their will and break the players, kind of how they did in the last... They, they didn't do it with the lockout, the last few CBA negotiations, but they did uh, kind of break down the players' collective in the last few negotiations, which we'll get to in a little bit, but that's kind of the difference between a lockout and a strike. And it yeah. is key to note that the lockout is not a necessary step. It's one that they actively chose to take. Yeah. So, um, from some experiences I've had just, uh, in things I've done kind of in my, my career, I've, I've been around some, uh, labor disputes and strikes and things. And the, the key thing to look at is, whoever implements it is usually the one in the position of uh, 
uh, of power and money. So like in this case, Major League Baseball is instituting a lockout because if they lock out the players, the players essentially don't get paid. And if the league can withstand the losses that they're going to uh, get longer than the players, then they expect the players to give in so that they could get back to work and get their paychecks. A strike goes the other way where the employees walk out and the, um, the company is essentially not making money, not getting their revenue. Well, being in the off season, Major League Baseball really isn't getting any revenue directly from the players. So in their eyes, they're not really losing any money here. They can still make money on jersey sales and all that stuff. The only difference is there's not really as much hype around free agencies or free agency and signings. So, Yeah, That's, so from that perspective, it's it's a good timing because they have plenty of time before it starts affecting the players' pay because they only get paid during the season. Um, yeah. Which is why and, the which is why the ninety four ninety five lockout or uh, sorry ninety four ninety five strike um, yeah. was so such a big deal because the players walked out and so there were games canceled and things because it happened in the season so it's one of those where if there was an actual strike it would almost have to occur during the season to be effective at all so but yeah so. That's kind of just the the basis of a lockout versus a strike and why this one is a lockout. But so with it being a lockout, what does that actually mean? Like the players just can't come into work, but like what does that actually affect? It's the off season. They're not doing anything. They're sitting at home, right? Yeah. So number one thing that we've already talked about is that it affects the transaction. So no uh, major league contracts can be signed by any players. Um, and then beyond that, there's a ton of like smaller things that are going to be affected. Basically, any player on the 40-man roster of the team, so that could include some minor league players, um, won't be able to work out at the team facilities. They won't be able to, to do rehab with the regular trainers that they use. So they'll, they'll, they're kind of on their own in this situation. Um, another thing for international players that I read about today is that players that were out of the country when the lockout started on December 2nd, um, could potentially lose their visas. Um, and it'll be a challenge to get them back in the country if they wanted to come back before the lockout ends. So that's another complication. And then the drug testing program is likely to be, uh, put on pause they're probably not going to do any drug testing d during the during the lockout yeah so uh th there's a couple of points in there that i kind of want to touch on a little bit more so um it, you mentioned this affects players on the 40-man roster um and so there's minor league players that came up maybe at the end of last year just got put on the 40-man roster to protect them in the rule five draft um so those players even though they may not have ever even like seen the major league field they've seen the major league field but they've never played on it ever they're now being locked out by by the um the owners so they can't come in and uh get as uh, their off-season work and it affects some uh some players like uh i i'm only versed in the cardinals 40 man really so i apologize that all my references here are going to be cardinals but juan yepes um he's a first base um I think first base corner outfield prospect uh, played in the uh, Arizona fall league was really, really, really good. He got added to the 40 man roster at the end of last season, never played on the big league club, but he now can't go and use team facilities. Whereas Nolan Gorman, who is in pretty much the exact same spot in his development as Juan Yepes, maybe a couple months behind, he's not on the 40 man. So he can still use team facilities. So it's kind of creating a, uh, a chasm almost in, um, like the development of minor leaguers, uh, depending on if they were essentially rule five eligible or not. So it yep. would be, and it's going to be interesting to see how that affects players coming into the next season. Yep. yep. And that rule five draft just to add on to that is not happening because that counts as a major league transaction. So that'll be probably happening when, whenever the lockout ends. Yeah. Which, um, the lockout is, 
basically until the owners say it's over, which at this point it's looking like that's going to be when a new CBA is signed. Correct. It, yeah. it could end at any time as long as they get, I think maybe unanimous consent from the owners or majority or whatever, but they're not going to end it until the CBA is over. Um, the other point um, that you mentioned that I wanted to touch on just a little bit. So um, players that are rehabbing can't use team facilities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely um, left on their own for everything medical. They do still have their health insurance to help pay for um, therapy and things like that. And that continues until the beginning of the 2022 season, at which point it goes away. Um, so for the next three months, they're good from that side. If it extends into the regular season, we'll start seeing more things about that. Um, yeah, I, uh, are there any other big things that, uh, that the lockout, uh, changes about the day-to-day -day of baseball that, uh, we know of that we haven't mentioned here? I mean, I'm sure there's tons, but. Yeah, I'm sure there's some other smaller things, but I think we we've hit on the big stuff. Okay. So I guess so now we know what the lockout is. We know what it does. We'll get to why it happened in a minute, but this didn't come out of out of left field for I feel like I need to come up with non-baseball sayings because i i found myself doing that at work too but now i'm using baseball sayings in a baseball pod and it just seems almost too meta there's a um, lot of baseball sayings that that regular non-baseball fans use i, I know I, I i used at work the other day i used that something was too inside baseball and <laughs> then there were like three people that didn't know what it meant and they're like that's not a saying and everyone else is like yeah it kind of is <laughs> it's like, so but yeah so uh but so we know what the lockout is um, we know sort of what it's affecting, but were the players prepared for this? Like, I, I guess it's a really bad transition. Cause I, I know what I'm trying to get you to say, and that's not going to get it. Um, Just skip the transition. Yeah. So the MLBPA put out a guide for players basically saying, here's what, what, uh, basically we need to be um, prepared to fight for. If it comes to a lockout or a strike or whatever, these are the things that we need to do and not back down. So well, I guess this kind of is the why it's happening. So I guess from from the Players Association side, why is this happening? What are they fighting for that Major League Baseball just doesn't want to give them? Yeah, so they've kind of separated into four different sections. They're all kind of related to each other, but number one is incentivizing competition. So they do not want teams that are not trying to win games um, while still making a bunch of money. And that's something that's become ever prevalent, especially under this most recent CBA, which has really been favorable to the owner's side, not so much to the players. Um, you want me to just do kind of an overview on these and then we can go back to each of the, the topics? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So the next one is ensuring the most talented players are on the field. So this kind of has to do with the way teams have manipulated service time in that they'll keep a player down in the minor leagues even when they're blatantly, clearly ready to contribute contribute at the major league level just so they can gain an extra year of control yeah. of that player. And uh, based a, on a notable one, just uh, in case that still isn't quite clear, uh, think of Chris Bryant when he was a rookie or what was being talked about last offseason. We talked about it on our pod, actually, at the beginning of the year with Jared Kelnick. Granted, when he ended up coming up and struggled, it kind of looked like it maybe wasn't as yeah. slam dunk so of a grievance and then but, of course Vladimir Guerrero um back in 2019 was another yeah. case for that so it's happened with these star level players um and that's it just doesn't make sense from from a fan perspective because 
you want to see the best players on the field at all times. If they're ready, they should be there. There's absolutely no reason they should be not at the the level they belong at. Yeah, it, um, it I- would be like if we put Mike Trout down at Salt Lake uh, in AAA with the Salt Lake Bees for a year just so that we could have him for an extra year in the end of his contract. We want to see yeah. Mike Trout now. Exactly. We don't care about Mike Trout when he's 41. Well, we we do. We probably still will. But <laughs> we want to see him now. That's right. Next one is reducing artificial restraints on co- competition. So this one's directly related to the competitive balance tax, which uh, was implemented actually back uh, in 1994 after that strike. Um, it's kind of changed over the years a little bit, but basically it's treated as a, as a cap on what owners are willing to spend um, because once they spend above this amount of money, so in 2021, it was set at $210 million. Um, so only two teams, the Dodgers and the Padres, went over that in 2021 because these owners are using the, the penalties, which is additional tax dollars on um, the money that's above that, that threshold, as a justification for not spending up to that limit. So that's something that hurts the players because they're just not getting, um, basically the, the teams are not spending money on, on players in a, in a free market system yeah. because of that tax. And then the fourth one here uh, from the, this, this player's uh, guide here is getting players their value earlier in their career. So this one is related to the service time issue, but it's also in the way that teams have shifted in the way that they value players. So teams are able to, um, older players are not getting as much, as many big contracts as they used to in the past because the value lies in finding these young players who can give you basically what the old players give you at a way lower cost because they're salary controlled because they're salary controlled and they're under contract for a a long period of time that's basically fixed yeah so So, yeah so that's what the players are um the players are pushing for uh in, in a nutshell and we'll dive into those here in a minute but what's Major League Baseball pushing for? Because from what I can tell, nothing. They're, they're pushing for the status quo. They want nothing to change. And they're trying to do everything in their power to keep the CBA the way that it is, essentially. Yeah, so in their brief proposals that they've made so far, they've only kind of put out some little nuggets like, sort of raising the competitive balance tax just a little bit, not in any meaningful way. So and, then, it's, it's, and then another one, they actually proposed lowering it by $30 million, but instituting a uh, soft floor um, yeah, which where actually, teams would and, be taxed if they spent less than $100 million. And when you actually calculate that out, you find that they're basically lopping off a couple hundred million in the total amount of money that the players get. So yep. it's, it's a kind of their way of spinning things and they're pretty good at that and they've shown that over the years that number one priority for the owners is is being profitable and and making a ton of money and and they've done that a lot do you want to actually go back and talk a little about about the the last two cbas leading up to this one yeah let's do it because i think that gives us a good a good way to talk about what they're asking for now so um basically the the CBA expires every five years. So we had a negotiation in 2011, uh, in 2016, and those two CBAs are eerily similar. Um, The first one being negotiated by, well, and that's probably the other good thing to talk about is who's actually the players that we're talking about, or the, the, I want to say the players, because the key actors in these negotiations. So from the baseball side, it's the commissioner and the chief operating officer of the league. So this year, it's Rob Manfred and Dan uh, Dan Halem. Uh, back in 2011, uh, when Bob Selig was the commissioner, he would have been on uh, the league side of the negotiating table here. 
on the player's side, you have uh, Tony Clark, um, who's the executive director of the MLBPA, and then the senior director of collective bargaining, uh, Bruce Meyer, who was hired in 2018 after uh, Rick Shapiro was uh, fired for what the players kind of viewed as a uh, poorly, poorly negotiated 2016 CBA. He was actually part of the 2011 one too. So I, I think they were just overall not too happy about him. So they, they hired Meyer. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so, so like I said, 2011 Bud Selig, he kind of set the stage and do you want to kind of give us a brief rundown of what, what happened there in 11? Yeah. So the biggest thing in 2011, um, was related to the draft. So prior to 2011, there were no real restrictions on, on, uh, how much money could be spent in the draft. There were rough, um, kind of guidelines from the commissioner's office saying this slot in the draft is worth this much money, but teams really were not required to follow those guidelines at all. So the larger market teams were able to spend up and get um, the best players in the draft. So Bud Selig, the commissioner who used to own the Milwaukee Brewers, a small market team was always kind of champion championing, championing their cause. Um, and trying to help out these smaller market teams be competitive. So what he did is he created a system in the draft where um, there's basically a fixed pool of money that they were allowed to spend. So then all the teams basically were were, uh, just certain about each level of the draft that they'd be picking from. So if you pick the best player at the top of the draft, uh, you, you wouldn't have to spend a crazy amount of money because it would be capped at some amount. essentially. Yeah. And, and like, well, and so they, they don't do it pick by pick, but they, they break it down uh, usually around the draft and say this, um, the slot value of this pick is going to be X number. And usually for the number one pick, it ends up being about, is it like 12 right. million for the right bonus? Now it's like, I think it's like eight million. Is it eight? I thought it was. I thought it was higher than ten, but not by much. And it falls off pretty quickly. It's like the top three are all around ten mil for their bonus, and then it falls off down to like three to four million, and then uh, for the rest of the top ten, and then it's like a million or less basically for the rest of the uh, first round. Is what I thought the slot values looked like, but that's that's kind of why uh, the Mets got into a little bit of a problem with uh, Kumar Rocker last year. Um, in a way, because they had a set amount of money that they could use. They got him with the 10th pick. He was projected to be a lot higher than that. So he wanted the basically the bonus that he should have gotten being a first three pick or whatever, and then led to some issues there. And he ended up not signing and went back to Vanderbilt and will be in the draft again this year. Yeah. So. so, but the point I was getting to with, with the whole thing being fixed now or after 2011, it was essentially a situation where teams knew that they wouldn't have to overspend and these picks are super valuable at this point because they know they don't have to pay up because Steven Strasburg got like $15 million in the draft when before this was uh, put in place. And then when you know you're getting the best player and you're going to be able to sign them for a reasonable amount of money, that pick becomes even more valuable. So, after that point, we saw the uh, the full tear down rebuild uh, from the Cubs and then the Astros right after that. So right away, you see when a new CBA comes into effect, the teams are always going to be looking for ways to exploit it and kind of shape it to their liking. And it really worked for the Cubs and the Astros back then because they knew that if they didn't really care about the, their product on the field. They would get high draft picks and they'd be able to really capitalize in the draft. And, and that's what they were able to do. Yeah. And I, as, as Steve Cohen, so, uh, uh, smartly and brazenly tweeted, uh, around the time of the draft, um, uh, baseball draft picks are worth up to five times their slot value to clubs. So he never shies away from investments that can make him that type of return. So now post 2011, there's essentially slot values and you don't really give a guy above slot because you 
can't if you're going to give all the rest of the guys you've drafted bonuses. So now you have the Cubs getting the first round pick or the first overall pick or the second overall pick for three, four, five years in a row. If they're getting four times or five times as much value from five guys in a row, they're all the top of the draft class. Like, yeah, why wouldn't you tank? Exactly. Yeah. So, and then the Astros did the exact same thing. And in recent years, you've seen the Pirates and the Orioles kind of going back and forth on getting those number one picks. And so we're 10 years in to the system and we're seeing the same thing. So. Yep. And then the other thing I'll mention from 2011 that I thought was notable was the introduction of the qualifying offer. So what that did is um, basically free agents that would leave their teams would um, let their old team get a draft pick compensation for losing that player in free free agency. And back in 2011, it was not a super strict policy. So even like mid tier players would still net their old clubs pretty decent picks. So they were happy to, to have that happen. But at the same time, um, it, it was not like, um, it, it was not good for the players because it, it hurt their, their markets because they had that, that, uh, qualifying offer attached them. Did that, did I explain that correctly? Add on if, yeah so so basically the it wasn't good for the players because what we're seeing right now with the way the qualifying offers work where you if you give a qualifying offer then uh whoever uh gets that player loses a draft pick um if they sign uh why well, they lose a they lose a pick if they sign a guy that had a qualifying offer in general right yeah yeah Um, but there's only so many qualifying offers being handed out now. Like I think the Dodgers gave out two and that was the most for a single team this year. Um, and that went to uh, Chris Taylor and Corey Seager, I think. Um, and, and because of the money involved with that offer, they're not going to give it to the mid, uh, the mid level guys. It's always going to go to your top tier players. And so those are the only ones who would have a draft pick loss associated with them. Um, but yeah, um, and then additionally, there's draft pick gain only for those guys. So, um, the Dodgers could only get two picks if, uh, both guys signed for 50 million elsewhere. Uh, those, they would get, those they rules would get two picks a little bit, but yeah, yeah. Th- those rules always confuse me, but yeah, they changed from 2011 to 2016, but regardless, there was some compensation for the team for losing yeah. their free agents. So. Um, but yeah, so it, essentially your guys like your John Gray are not going to net you a pick now. Um, yep. Granted, John Gray should have got a qualifying offer. He should have netted him a pick, but I'm not the GM of the Rockies. So yeah, I feel like the Rockies just make you mad every time you like even think about them. They do. Yeah. Love their stadium. Love the city. I love a couple of the players that have come through there. I hate the team. <laughs> yeah. Tough situation there. Yeah. Um, d- wait, did I mention that the uh, competitive balance uh, threshold increased in 2011, but only by $6 million in year one? Yeah, and then was it 11 or 16 when the penalties um, got significantly stiffened? That was 2011 when they they created tiers of the the threshold. So, based on how much you exceeded the tre- threshold, you'd have to pay more tax and more tax. Yeah. So that that made it even less likely that a team like uh, the Yankees, um, who went over the luxury tax a lot under uh, George Steinbrenner back in the uh, mid 90s, um, they don't do that anymore because they don't want to pay yeah. these considerably higher taxes the higher up they go so they're going to stick to that kind of they're going to stick right at that threshold a little bit below and then they're just going to hang out there occasionally go over a little bit and then immediately come back down so let's see and then so i think that pretty well sums up 16 or uh, 11 sorry 2011 so then what What's the difference between 2011 and 2016? 
Yeah, so in 2016, keep this in mind as we continue to talk about this, but this is what MLBPA was asking for in their proposal. They did not want uh, that draft pick con uh, compensation attached to any free agent, so they wanted that completely dropped, no qualifying offer kind of thing. Uh, well, so wanted... I, I, I think that one is they didn't want a team to lose a pick for signing a qualifying offer. They were fine with a um, with a team getting a pick for losing a player that they gave a qualifying offer to. It's the other part that they didn't want. OK, so... yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, then they also wanted the competitive balance tax increased significantly, and then they wanted a different order a draft order formula instead of just taking the worst team and giving them the first pick second worst team giving them the second pick because that seems a little silly and unfair because that's the direct incentive to tank so you can get that top pick so it would be a formula which is 60 percent based on their record but then 40 percent based on other factors including the size of their market um another one would be um, in the in the system that they have for salary increases, uh, there'd be more super two, what, what's known as super two players, who are players that have uh, two years of service time, but they're um, they're some of the best players in their service class. You could call it. So I I thought it was based on it was the guys who had not. A They've eclipsed two years, but not three, but they have the most, or it's the 22% with the most service time out of yeah, the... Yeah, so it's the guys with the most service time, yeah. Yeah, so it's not necessarily based on talent. Um, it's based on time that you've been up. So yeah. you can basically use service time manipulation to prevent Super 2s. Granted, it's a lot harder to prevent Super 2s than it is to just extend a year to arbitration. Um, because it's it's based on a percentage, so it really depends on every other player how much they've played, if you're going to become a Super 2 or not. Um, between 11 and 16, I do believe there was a, um, there was a bump. Increase it went from 17% yeah. in the 2011 CBA uh, that would be Super 2s to 22% in the 2016 CBA. So uh, it, it was a significant improvement there uh, from the player's side, but still not to the level that they would want. So, and another thing they wanted is the players before arbitration. So zero to three years of service time, those players could get more bonuses uh, through this proposal. And they also wanted to change the way that service time was actually counted instead of just by days that you're, um, you know, an active major league player, which is the way it's counted now. And the point being, they didn't really get many of the things that they were asking for in 2016. I mean, really, when we're looking at this list, what did they actually get? They got a slight increase in the in the Super 2 players. And I think that's it. That's really what? it. So they kind of gave in to everything that the owners wanted, which was just keeping things the way they were back in 2011. Yeah. And they, there was no lockout, no strike, nothing that year. They got the new CBA done before the previous one had expired. And um, there's just reading some articles um, from the, uh, the athletic here. Um, uh, there was a quote in Evan Drellich's article from September 23rd about kind of how we got here. And um, this was pre lockout, but he was kind of talking about how there was probably going to be a lockout. But uh, basically, there was a lot of people who back in the 2016 time frame thought that the players really probably should have been prepared for a lockout and went to that to get some of the chips that they wanted. They didn't. Nothing really changed between those two CBAs. So now here we are in 2021. The players were prepared for a lockout. Here we are. So now what's going to happen this year? Are they going to get anything that they ask for and what and what are they asking for I, I mean we kind of briefly touched on it already but they're asking for incentivizing competition by um uh 
basically changing the revenue sharing uh, for anti-tanking measures. Um, they want a much higher CBT threshold of, uh, I think they've asked for 240 million and we were at 210 here in 2021. They've proposed a 60, 40 draft order formula. They've proposed more super two players. They've proposed, sur uh, no more surrendering a draft pick when a free agent signs. Uh, they've proposed bonuses for pre-arb players and, uh, how service time is credited and a raise to the minimum salary everything they're asking for in 2021 is exactly what they were asking for in 2016. Yeah. It, exactly. at a high level. So, so, so really, when you think about it, most, the most likely scenario, very likely scenario is that they're not going to get many of these things that they're asking for. There's some stuff that I think I would think they're going to push a little bit harder for than they did in 2016, or at least those will be more kind of sticking points for them rather than, just something that they're asking for. Yeah. Um, yeah. Agreed. Um, I do think that they're, I, I would expect to see a little bit more happen this time around than the last one, just because I, I there's been some things that the uh, league has been wanting um, that uh, we, we said earlier, the league doesn't really want anything specific. They're just kind of throwing out occasional. We would like for this to happen. Expanded playoffs being one of them. Mm -hmm. And the players have said, yeah, we'll contemplate expanding the playoffs. Not as far as you want to go. And so they're throwing that back on the on the table as a bargaining chip that they can then use as leverage to hopefully get some of these things that they're asking for. Um, which I don't think was really in the cards last time. Something notable that is not in here that I think the players would like to be in here as more leverage um, there were a lot of rule change experiments that were going on this year. We talked about them in an episode earlier in the year, and I think everyone thought that that was going to be part of the CBA, right? Yeah, it would, it would make a lot of sense. So where are the, where's the proposals from the players and the league on that? Uh, does not seem likely because the situation is so acrimonious I don't really think that that's going to be one of the pressing so, things. I, I'm going to need uh, you to choose a cheaper word. We can't afford that one. Acrimonious. Uh, not happening. I, I don't know what it means. I need you to explain it. Uh, like very bitter. How gotcha. about that? That works. So the rule changes would be nice, and there's something that would seemingly advance the game make the game better for the fans better for the players really just a better game in general but i don't think the league really is seeing that as something that they're going to be prioritizing here because they're just focused on the the money aspect of it and the, the it's just a labor negotiation there's never really been any precedent for having rule changes on the field stuff being part of this negotiation at all yeah which there's nothing that says that they can't be right. The, the big thing that I think a lot of people don't really remember is that um, if major league baseball proposes a rule change and the union says, no, Rob Manfred has the power to a year later um, implement it uh, unilaterally. unilaterally. Yeah. So they don't really want to put those as bargaining chips because they could basically just say, okay, we won't change the rules for 22. We'll tell them that we would like to in a separate agreement. They say no, because there's, they're not getting anything from it. And then we'll do it next year anyway, in 2023. So they've, uh, the league has essentially with some of the powers that they have taken rule changes right off the table and, uh, away from the players as leverage. So. What, and can you talk specifically about, what some of those rule changes just to to remind me and other people like well, which ones were on the that that were kind of at the forefront people thought were going to be important to this negotiation yeah that don't so, seem like they're going to be so the biggest one was the pitch clock so there were all the tests that uh, especially out in what used to be the California League I think it's uh, Low A West um, or whatever they call it now um, where they were doing the fifteen second pitch clock and. It, 
there were great reviews from fans, from the players on the field. Um, I think offense much, was up, right? Offense was up. Pitchers really didn't hate it. Um, there were certain situations where they were like, yeah, that kind of sucked. But in general, they got used to it. Um, and so there was a presentation given to uh, the major league clubs about it and everything. And I obviously they're probably not going to want change, but I, it'll come at some point. Um, another one was uh, potentially banning the shift or uh, at least partially banning the shift where you have to have two players on either side of the infield. Um, you have to have four guys on the infield dirt. Um, that, that was one. I think uh, making the bases uh, slightly bigger by like an inch or two. Um, uh, stuff like that was all on the table and it had all had um, positive results um, in the, the experiments, but those are things that were thought to be big pieces in the CBA negotiation that are now looking like they will not be a factor at all. Um, and then the other one, bringing the DH to the national league. So, um, and that one's kind of obvious. I don't think I really have to explain that one. Yeah, So, for sure. Let's go back to that proposal actually that MLB did give. So, We've talked about some of the things that they proposed, but they're basically saying, hey, we're not budging on a lot of these issues until um, until you guys drop some of the things that you want to uh, to talk about. And the specific ones that they do not want to discuss at all are the number of years that it takes uh, to get to free agency for players. So in the current system, uh, Typical player has six years of control by the teams. And the first three years is the pre-arbitration phase where they just make standard kind of raises. Those are pretty much fixed amounts. They don't really have any control about how much money they make, regardless of how good they are as a player. Yeah, and and those, those raises that they can get in like year two and year three, those are completely at the whim of the owner or the ownership. Right. They're not even like, necessary they're, you they're non-negotiable don't they don't have to do it yeah they usually do it as a good faith measure um, and, but it's not a, it's not really a lot of money and usually in those first three years the players that are good to great are getting severely underpaid uh relative to what they're providing to the team which is why you see some of these young guys um signing pretty big contracts early on um, some of the the note or like the first ones that happened were like Paul DeYoung, who signed a six year, twenty four million dollar deal after his first year. Scott Kingery signed a deal roughly the same before he played in the majors. Evan yeah. White signed a contract like that here about two years ago. Um, so you're seeing there's, these guys. There's been that, plenty of players. So they're buying out these years of pre arbitration, and then in a lot of cases, also their years of arbitration. So I'll talk quickly about that system. So once they get past three years of service time, they go into the arbitration system where they are able to submit a number to the team for the amount of money they should be making. Then the team can uh, say what they'd like to pay the player. If the two sides can't come to an agreement, then um, a group of people, the arbitrators come together and kind of judge them based off their performance using some statistics and and different things like that to come to a fair um, assessment of what this player should be making based off historical precedent. And um, it's, it's a really good thing for players and it's really worked very well for players kind of being happy that they're actually getting a chance to make the money that they, that, that they should be making. Yeah, the the one qualm that the players have with it is the criteria that the arbitrator or the arbiters, arbiters, arbitrators, Uh, arbiters, arbiters. Yeah. What was I saying? Um, Yeah. So the the one qualm that players have is the uh, stats that arbiters uh, are basically allowed to use to do this. And and I think there's basically like a set. This is the information you get to decide on. And it's a lot of the the stats that nowadays Old we know don't really mean anything. It's 
I mean, they mean stuff, but not very like. They're not the best way to represent a player's value. Yeah, like you know that there's better ways. They're to looking do it, at so. batting average and home runs, just purely just those really. Um, and yeah. then they're looking at like wins as a pitcher. Um, Are they actually looking at wins? I think so. I don't think they're looking at wins. Are they not? But well, but they're, you, they're you, get my, at, you get my like, point though. They're looking yeah, at yeah. essentially arcane stats that they're they mean something. They don't yeah. necessarily mean that that player is worth this much. There's a lot better things using things like your uh, your WOBA and your WAR and just all of these advanced statistics that actually show your value. I feel like this so. would be a super easy thing to revamp, right? You could teach the arbiters the a better way to uh, evaluate these players, and and you could get an even better arbitration system. Yeah, or you could do what MLB said and just say, oh, we'll get rid of arbitration altogether and we'll just pay you for uh, what you had in war last year based on yeah. a set value for war, which uh, there's uh, people use a set value for war is like a, an, uh, of what war is worth um, to a team, essentially. Uh, and I think recently that's been about eight and a half million per war is kind of like the value of a win. Um but, but they with that system, but they, they have no be, they have no bargaining power basically they have no way to yeah there's I mean, no bargaining there's, power and it's completely left to um base or baseball perspectives whatever, if they use warp or, fan graphs if they use f war or uh baseball reference if they use b war so like yeah. it's three completely unrelated groups that would then basically be setting the values of these players and what they're going to be getting so and as we know war does not value players um, exactly the same or there are some types of players and skill sets that are not really valued by war like guys that don't get strikeouts they're going to be really hurt by this uh, defensive catchers uh, get screwed yep uh unless you're using f4 but even then i don't know how how accurate it really is there's but yeah so that's uh that's never gonna fly with with the players no so but so i guess that kind of kind of the way arbitration has been going and with the um like the minimum salaries kind of being where they're at that coupled with some of the other big issues that they've been talking about like with uh the luxury tax threshold that they say is kind of um, deflating player values because teams aren't willing to spend more. So the upper level players are still getting their worth, but then it basically uh, crunches down these contracts for the middle guys. Um, so with all of that kind of together, um, it, it what am I trying to say? Um, basically, there's been a set amount of money that teams have been spending every year, and it's really not changed. And players have been getting kind of screwed and saying that the league isn't spending enough. Um, and I'm trying to get to that graph, basically. Uh, so feel free to help me out here if you've got a good way to do that. But uh, yeah, so in the in the statement that Rob Manford put out, um, Basically, here, uh, right when they did the lockout, he said, um, uh, while we have heard repeatedly that the free agency is broken, uh, in the month of November, $1.7 billion was committed to free agents, smashing the prior record by nearly four times. By the end of the offseason, clubs will have committed more money to players than in any offseason in MLB history. So that doesn't necessarily um, bring the arbitration in, but... From a money uh, side in general, from looking at uh, what the players are getting in free agency, the way that the arbitration system has been working, and uh, the the luxury tax and all of these money related things, MLB is basically saying that they're paying players more than they ever have in the past, right? That's what they're claiming, yeah. And it, without having any any data 
to show you that that's true or not, what would your gut say? I know you know the answer, but like before you saw this graph, what would you have said? Just based off uh, how well they're doing revenue wise, I would I would definitely guess that the players are getting less if they're really not um, they've not increased. Yeah, anything for them. So. Um, yeah, so there's there's actually a graph that was created by uh, uh, Este uh, Rivi or Este Rivera um, that shows the MLB payroll as a percentage of league revenue, and so with arbitration uh, kind of being delayed to three years, the minimum salary being so low, um, these guys not necessarily getting what they're worth for the first six years of their career, and then free agency being brought down you actually have seen a decrease of 16% uh, of uh, payroll being spent or of league revenue being spent on payroll. And so um, I, I guess where I was trying to get with this is basically we see that all these proposals by the Players Association that we say they're probably not going to get, but this is exactly why they've been asking for it. Because in 2011, um, 43% of league revenue was spent on payroll just over the course of these two CBAs that they're now trying to basically come back from, it's decreased another 5%. So that's a big drop in money. Um, and yeah. so that's that's kind of why the players have been so adamant and not wanting to drop any of their proposals here. So, And a big thing that we haven't really talked about so far is how the revenue sharing plays into this and, and how that kind of works. So... The way revenue sharing works is to kind of, or the idea behind it is to help out the the lower revenue teams by taking some of the this revenue that the the big clubs are making and kind of redistributing it. So there's two parts of it. There's a central fund, which is, um, which is revenue that comes from national sources, so like TV deals from like ESPN and whoever carries baseball games, playoff games and all that, that, that amount of money is all just equally divided between the 30 clubs. So that accounted for $2.76 billion in 2018. So a decent amount of money. I don't know what that is divided by 30, but that's how much each team got just from that part of it. And there's another part of it. 2.7 billion. 2.7 2.7 billion divided by 30 teams. Uh, that is oh crap. I should have added the zeros. Uh, two <laughs> seven zero zero uh, zero zero zero. That's million. There's billion divided by 30. Uh, 90 million dollars team. Yeah, so that's that's a pretty nice uh, chunk of change that you're getting without doing really anything. You don't have to spend a certain amount of money. You're getting that money no matter what. The second part of it is from the local uh, ro- local revenue. So that's a f- about half of your local revenue is um, kind of redistributed. So the bigger revenue teams, like the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Red Sox, the Cubs, uh, those teams are essentially taking some of their revenue and they're, it, it's being paid out to the lower revenue clubs. Um, like, like the, the, like the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, the Cardinals are, they're a payer actually, but oh, the, they, they don't now? pay that much. Okay. Um, but like teams like the Marlins, the athletics, the Rays, the Royals, these teams are getting a bunch of money. Um, and basically the idea behind it, at least as stipulated in these CBAs is that clubs are supposed to use their revenue sharing money to enhance their winning percentage. But that's not really a thing that's necessarily enforced. I, I, I think can, the I think the phrase in good faith is also somewhere in that clause. Probably. Uh-huh. So the thing is, teams like the Rays, teams like the Marlins, they their payrolls are so low. Not not really the Marlins now, but but the Guardians, for example, their payroll is way lower than the amount of money that they're getting just from revenue sharing. 
So, yeah, and, and the, I think the Pirates last year uh, were in the 30 millions for their total uh, payroll, right? Yeah, which is absolutely absurd when yeah, they're making and, and they're over getting, 100 million. Yeah, and they're getting 90 million just from the the national TV deals, and then they're only spending 30 million on the roster, while also tanking and taking advantage <laughs> of the other system we've already talked about. So this is really a a very key issue of this whole situation because teams have no they're not really held accountable for spending such a low amount of money even though they're continuing to make profits even when their team's very bad and they're not even trying to win at all yeah and so something that a lot of teams do use that money for is is, because they they do use some of that money in uh manner in a manner that would then project trying to improve the team so they put it in their analytics department they put it into um uh, training rooms, all all this stuff that it does legitimately help, but they're not putting anything into uh, essentially the players' pockets. Yeah, which is what the original intention of that was to be able to give the Rays a chance to compete with the Yankees. They they do now, but that's because of something entirely different that they've managed to figure out. Um, so they're not using this in the way it was intended, they're just competitive because of something unrelated to the CBA. So it kind of ticks players off. And honestly, rightfully so, I think. It, it, I would yeah. want my employer to invest in me. Absolutely, so, yeah. I get it. So I don't know. This is a tough situation, and I don't know if this is necessarily something that they're going to be even visiting in these talks, but... I feel like they need to somehow say, have a way to to make sure that the teams are actually investing at least some of that money that they get from revenue sharing into the payroll. Yeah, like I don't know how e- they do e- that. Even if they say X percent of this money has to go directly to payroll, and then yeah. the rest you use in other manners to help improve the team. Yep. So that you're still putting money into your analytics department, you're still putting money into your training room. But thirty percent of a hundred million, so thirty million dollars goes directly into payroll. You double the pirates' payroll right there. Like, yeah. But so there's that, and then there's the draft, which we haven't well, really talked about. Well, that um, one other thing with the um, uh, profit sharing, um, or rev- revenue, revenue sharing. sharing. Um, I mean, it's basically profit sharing. Yeah. Uh. But the other thing with that is is the players have actually been proposing some other things that could actually increase that that number as well. So, um, like, for instance, they've suggested putting patches on the uniforms like the NBA does. Um, just one patch with one sponsor, th- then that money then goes into the revenue sharing pot as well. Um, the players union has been looking at other things that are... Um, team related that aren't a hundred percent tied to the baseball team itself. So looking at like in St. Louis ballpark village, the union is looking at trying to figure out how to make a portion of like ballpark villages revenue part of this as well. So, so they're looking at uh, trying to increase uh, the revenue sharing um, revenue sharing pot. Well, I think also decreasing revenue sharing a little bit so that these bigger teams are willing to spend so it's a really complicated situation, but it's it's not even just as simple as saying teams aren't spending this on what they're supposed to. It's that, and there's all this other revenue that they've managed to get um, slightly outside the definition of revenue sharing that uh, is leading these teams to be worth more now than they've ever been in the past. And then the payrolls are still the same, and you're seeing even more uh, percentage of revenue um, as payroll decreasing. So basically, they're looking at every possible way to increase that percentage. Yep. Uh, but yeah, now to the draft. Sorry, I, I just thought that those were some notable points there. So no, definitely were. Yeah. So uh, MLB proposal for the draft is that. They go with the NBA style draft lottery for the first three picks in the draft. So, I mean, I guess that's a good start, but I feel like that's not really enough. 
to disincentivize uh, just tanking for those top picks. Yeah. Um, so is, is that how the NBA does it? Is just the first three or draft or it's our, our lottery? The, it's it's the all the teams that don't make the playoffs essentially. So basically, the the full fourteen first fourteen are all lottery, and they go in the order that yeah. they're picked. And obviously, if you're the first team out of the playoffs in NBA, you don't have a very high likelihood of uh, winning the number one pick in the draft. Essentially. Okay. Gotcha. Um. But yeah, the the first three picks, I I wouldn't think that would be effective at all, just from the standpoint of like, Kumar Rocker went tenth overall, didn't he? Yeah. And like he was supposed to be a top four pick. So, let's say for instance, there's a lottery that um the the Pirates who took I think they they took Henry Davis last year, um, but let's pretend just for a minute that the Pirates wanted Kumar Rocker, the number one pick. There was a lottery. The Pirates did not get in the first three picks. They got number four. Kumar Rocker still would have been available. They still could have got their same guy for less money still. So it's like that doesn't really seem like a very good deterrent for tanking because they're still going to tank, get their guy at number four, which still would have... It decreases his slot value even more and then gives him the ability to go out there and say, well, three teams didn't want you that were before us, so we're going to give you even less money than you deserve, even though it was going to be their guy at number one. So I don't personally like that proposal. I don't know what I would do. There's been some really complicated uh, ideas for this, though. Um, there was yeah, something one... where where teams that are actually close to making the playoffs but actually miss out are the teams that have better chances uh, to get that top pick because you're essentially incentivizing trying even when you're not um, like a surefire, really amazing team that's going to be in the playoffs, but you should get some rewards for actually trying to put a good product on the field, even if you're not the best. Yeah. So, and there was, there was one that I saw that, uh, this was from Ken Rosenthal's article where he was coming up with his own proposals and, and some of Ken's ideas pretty solid. Like, uh, for, for the draft, he's, uh, Ken Rosenthal is saying, well, do a lottery for low revenue teams with the top 10 picks, giving weighted advantages to the ones with the best records. So the top 10 is the low revenue guys all the time, basically you have a higher chance of the number one pick if you're better to give all these lower teams a chance to get the the big guys. Uh, But then there was one that he had noted that uh, a player agent suggested a draft order where the first 10 picks go to the lowest revenue clubs, the first selection going to the low revenue club with the highest record, then picks 11 through 20 are the postseason teams, all of the postseason teams. And then uh, 21 through 30 are all of the non-low revenue, non-playoff teams. Okay, yeah. So That's if you don't make the play, but... so if you don't make the playoffs, and you don't receive money essentially, or you're not the 10 that received the most money, or however that works, um, then you get screwed pretty much all the time, and you're never going to get a top 10 pick. If you miss the playoffs, you're guaranteed to be somewhere in the twenties. So yeah, that's, so that's like the the hell spot that you don't want to be in at all. So I guess oh, that and, would and work. that one is in descending order of record. Okay. So if you're if you don't receive money for uh in the revenue sharing, and you lose a hundred games, you're getting the thirtieth pick in the draft. Is how that would work. So. I guess is one way to incentivize not tanking. Right. But that's a, that one's a bit complicated and I don't think that'll fly with anybody, but it's an interesting thought experiment. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I do, I do kind of like Ken's proposal there though, like doing the top 10. Uh, I don't know that I would necessarily do it with just the low revenue teams. I would give the higher revenue teams a chance at the number one pick. Uh, As long as they didn't make the playoffs, I would give them like one chip in the spinny wheel 
Yeah. Um, just because otherwise I think it almost becomes too unfair because you're going to have your, your teams that are kind of like middle market, like, like the Cardinals, for instance, that are always going to be kind of in that um, middle 10 at best. Um, that's not a good example, though, because I think they've picked in the 20s literally every year I've been born. So, you know. I think there's one one more topic that we need to hit on before we get out of here, and that's the uh, Players Association proposal to change the number of years to get to free agency yeah and tied with the raising of the minimum salary so So, i this one i i'll i'll break it down because i want you to correct me if i'm wrong because I, i i think i understand it but i'm not positive so from what I'm seeing is uh, the current system is you have six years of team control, three pre arb years, three arbitration years, and then you become a free agent. doesn't matter what age you are. In this case, Juan Soto will become a free agent at the age of 25. Um, they're, I believe they're proposing keeping that, but if um, the first, so the first year of the new CBA, that would be the system, period. Yep. The second year, it's that, or if you have five years of service and you're twenty or uh, you're thirty and a half, um, then you would become a free agent at five years, not six. But the six still exists for younger players. Correct. Okay, that's the part that I wasn't sure if I understood. And then in the second year, or I guess it would be the third year of the CBA, um then it would go to five years and 29 and a half uh, would be your free agent year if you're not young enough and have hit six already. Yeah. Um, so this would affect guys like, uh, I think the, the 29 and a half, five years of service would affect a guy like Aaron Judge. Yep. It would give That's him the- a free agency a year sooner. Yeah, and but it is important to note that this one would not have affected Chris Bryant. He still would have been a free agent after 2021 if this was in place back in 2015. Yeah, just so because this only he, was, affected he a came very up late, small, right? Because Chris Bryant yeah, he, was a college player and then was held down, and then he would have just got to year five or year six or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And um, so really this is not a drastic change from what we already have. I don't, I I also don't really think that this is going to end up happening. I don't, I don't see them getting the number of years to get to free agency changed at all, because this only affected like 5% of players. The bigger one though, is the minimum salary, uh, which they need to get raised because right now about $570,000, which is the lowest of any major sports league. Yeah, and, and it's, it's also than... the sports league that has the most players um, yep. and the most players making the minimum salary. Which is so. over about 50% of the league. So yeah. this affects a ton of players. If they're able to get this raise. Yeah. And... Well, and, and so there's, I think there was a number like 70 or 75% of the league makes less than a million a year. Um, which then with the minimum salary being 570, 575, somewhere in that range. It's not really a huge increase there. Usually by the time that you hit arbitration, you're at about a million. Um, So it just speaks to how many players are making the league minimum. And and while $570,000 is a lot of money, if I made that in a year, I would be ecstatic for the um, I I think it needs to be stated that in the market or the uh, industry that they're in, that is chump change that that's nothing for for the amount of money that they bring into these teams they're worth hundreds of times that uh well maybe not hundreds 10 times that um and and steve cohen literally said it best these young guys that they're worth five times their value in in the draft and then you're getting league minimum for these guys like ronald acuna made league minimum for his first two years um and then he signed a hundred million dollar contract after but look at what he did in his rookie season. He was worth right. probably what thirty five million that season, making five hundred and fifty. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
that's, yeah, so. that's a definitely a key issue for the players association because we're seeing now so many of these young stars that are pretty much the best players on their team, but they're getting paid like, the lowest player in the league. Well, and then add on to that the fact that these guys are so young that they just got abused in a minor league system that pays them not enough to live. And yeah. they're going to be a little bit upset. Right. <laughs> like, it makes sense. Like, And another thing that it's going to affect, if they if they were able to raise this minimum salary, let's just say it's uh, $2 million. They're not going to get that high, but let's say it's $2 million. Then you won't have the the side effect of teams just shuffling players up and down because they won't want to be paying that uh, that major league salary for all those players. The Cubs used like 67 players this year. Would they be able to do that if the if the if the salary was a little bit higher? Maybe not. Probably not. And and I I saw something that said that um like a a realistic minimum salary would be 800,000. That would so, be great, actually. That's a very significant increase over what they have now. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'd be a little over 33%, I think. It'd be like a 40% increase, roughly, yeah. um, which is very significant. And when that becomes your start, and then you still get your in-good-faith raise so that you don't like, throw a big fit during arbitration and potentially win and cost the team more then by the time that you reach arbitration, you're probably going to be around a million dollars instead of being around 750000 or a million if you're good. But it then increases the salaries across the league, which then increases the percentage of money spent on payroll by as a percentage of revenue and affects all of the players, not just saying well, Max Scherzer just signed a contract that's worth $43.3 million AAV, which is the highest in history. Yeah, his is the highest in history, but Keen Wong, who's bounced around like four or five teams in the last three years, is making 570000 Yeah, and so, props to, to Big Mac, Mad Max because he's, you know, speaking up for the less highly paid players. Yeah. Even though he doesn't really need to, but that's that's good for him saying that he he said that he wants players to get paid when they're younger. So yeah, I like that. And he was a guy that wasn't really up when he was young. Like he was a late yeah, bloomer, yeah. wasn't he? Like yeah, he would he, he would have he would have also been um or taken the full six years to get to free agency. I think wouldn't he? Yeah. So. So the free agency proposal for or from the players wouldn't have affected Max Scherzer either. <laughs> but let's see. Is there anything else big that we're missing? Like there's so much around the CBA. It's like it's it's almost hard to just go topic by topic even because they're so interconnected that yep. then you kind of lose your your spot of what you've talked about. Uh, artificial restraints on competition. <clears throat> um, I guess the, the last thing that I kind of want to ask you and, um, uh, what do you think of the idea of a salary floor? Um, I do not really think that it's going to have the effect that people want it to, because I think the teams that it would affect. So it, it affects the guardians. It affects the, the rays. So they'll basically spend up to that floor and then they'll, that'll be like a maximum as well as a floor for them. So it just changes the, the, I mean, it doesn't really change much and it's not really gonna affect the overall amount of money that's being spent too much. And, and at the same time, teams might be able to just kind of get around it by spending a, a whole bunch of money on one player that doesn't necessarily help their overall team. This is baseball we're talking about. One player is not going to really change that much for you, and that might be a way to evade that that salary floor in, yeah. the, in the spirit of competition. Yeah, that, that's fair. It, it does probably help from a... a Total league revenue standpoint doing that though. 
if you think about it, because they're going to sell jerseys to that top tier guy that they had to sign because they had to spend money. So they went out and gave with with the patch on it. Yeah, with the patch on it. That uh, what I'm trying to think of who like what my scenario here would be for top of the line guy going to like a random team that they you wouldn't expect him to be on, and also what patch would be on their jersey. I think it would have to be like. Mad Max to the Orioles with like a uh shoot, I don't even know, like a Werther's original <laughs> okay. patch. That uh, that'd be perfect. Love it. All right. Uh you got anything else that you want to discuss with the CBA while we're here? Um it's- yeah, there's a lot to talk about, but I we hit on quite a lot of it. But I'm sure we'll be checking back in throughout the off season and seeing how things are going. Maybe nothing's going to happen for a while, but we'll get yeah. some news at some point. Yeah. So if there's anything that we missed talking about that you would like to hear us kind of expand on, or anything that would be cool to bring to our attention, let us and know. If there's by- anything that we didn't explain, or you have another question about, we'll try to get you the answer. Yeah, so uh, reach out to us. Uh, you could whisper us on Twitch. Uh, you could uh, tweet at us or message or uh, uh, send us a message on Facebook. Uh, comment on our YouTube video. Um, what else? What else can you do? Uh, you, know, you probably like send, send, send me, me a letter. Yeah, I was gonna say send me a letter. Not sure I want to put my uh, address out there, but <laughs> sure. Um, but yeah, so but let us know your thoughts. What if we explain things properly? If there's things that you want to know, things that uh, we it, it didn't understand and we talked about, feel free to tell us we were wrong. I sure all for it. But yeah, but so um, with that being said, we are going to leave it here uh, for the week. So. Um, our Twitter and Facebook are at getaway day pod. Uh, all of our episodes can be found anywhere. You listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, Google, pick your favorite. We're there. Um, and have a great rest of your day.